Okie do, I just see that the light is flashing now, so I think we can maybe start. Good evening everybody for those who are on okay. this side of the ocean and well, happy lunchtime or whatever back in the American side of the world. Um, I'm very pleased today to have my very first <laughs> transatlantic conference, or where I can at least moderate, and I'm very pleased to introduce Marika Ramen Camero Mojiga, who is currently mm -hmm. a teacher and a teacher trainer, which is very dear to me in Venezuela. Um, so we share some things, a passion for English, I guess, and the teacher trainers. On the other hand, uh, Marika Ramen has some qualities which I sorely lack. Mm -hmm being the fact that she is also an expert in distance learning or long distance learning and very much involved with anything to do with digital uh, machinery and wizardry which happens to happen sometime. <laughs> so I look very much forward to hear about the myths and facts on, of online assessment which, or, or about which I know nothing. So without further ado, I'm going to give the floor to Marika Amen and I hope you all had a good time. Okay, so I'm going to disconnect my camera Microphone. Okay. <laughs> okay, while the slides are loading, well, thank you very much for the introduction. And well, it's a pleasure for me to be connected with you all from Venezuela. And I am even more pleased to be sharing with you ideas, thoughts, and experiences on a topic which is a very very interesting for any ESL or ESL teacher. Well, um, this time I'm talking about some myths and facts on ESL online assessment or online ESL assessment. And I want to clarify that the statements I'm about to present, they are based on my own experience um, using online based assessment strategies. And as you may know, on the internet, we can find many, but many authentic material that can be useful as far as the resources we use in our English classroom. In fact, there are many websites for teachers or students of English who, um, there are many websites, and they have many practical activities for linguistic skills or grammar exercises that we can use as complementary materials in our classrooms or outside the classroom. But I think that the big question here, the most important question here, is is it possible to apply assessment strategies online? Would that be possible? And I think it is possible. Actually, I used to have the opposite belief some years ago. But with the, the statements I'm presenting, you're going to see how that changed through years. Um, I, I would like to check if you are listening to me all. Are you listening to me? So try to type on the chat box if you are listening to me, please. <laughs> OK. Loud and clear. OK, thank you very much. Can you see the slide? Well, let me see. It seems I have a problem looking at the slides. So, Okay. Did you see that I changed the slide? All right. So let me see what I can do over here.
Wait a second. I know I can. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Um, I've just uh, changed the slides on my screen. Can you see a change now? I'm about on the second slide, which is called Online Years of Assessment. Can you see that one? No, I can't see them. I'm going mm -mm. back now, no. one slide. Okay, then. So what I can do is I'm going to look at the slides on my computer and I'm going to be changing them for the rest of the audience because it seems that you can all see them. So that could be an option. Okay, so in, on the second slide, um, on the second slide, we have several statements. We have four statements, um, which are about some of the things we're going to be discussing over here. As, as I suppose you're looking at, the first statement says, online assessment favors students copy and paste. Is that right? Is that what you're reading? You can answer me on the chat box. All right, so this is the first statement, and I want you to tell me if you consider it a myth or a fact. Give me your opinion on the chat box, please. A fact, fact, okay. What about the rest of you? <laughs> Not sure. We're discussing number one, Angela. Okay, so it seems that most of you consider it a fact and some of you consider it a myth. Now, the second one. We have the second one. It's practical for the teacher to give feedback to students' production of English. That one. Do you consider it a myth or a fact? Tell me your opinion, please. Myth. Okay. Myth. Angela said that online assessment favors students' everyday practices. Okay, fact, fact. Okay, most of you consider it a fact. And number three, online quizzes give the opportunity of cheating. Is that possible in online quizzes? What do you think? Myth or fact? Okay, someone here said it's a myth. 
That's number three. Uh -huh. Jane says it's a fact, but not if the quiz is well designed. Jose, it depends. Well, that's an option. You can say it depends. I'm torn. It's <laughs> Andres. Mm -hmm. Just says that if you come up with the correct answer, it's a learning experience, so what's the problem? And it depends. Well, it sends most of you that it depends. What about number four? Skills integration in online assessments is impossible. Do you consider it a fact or a myth? Myth, myth, myth. Jordana says it's good for the pretest. Myth, myth. Myth. Okay, most of you consider it a myth. Now let's go to the next slide. And we're going to start with the first statement. Online assessment favors students copy and paste. Well, I, me, Mari Carmen Gamero, I consider it a myth. And why? Because this depends more on, on the way the teacher set the test than on the tool itself. For example, if we're going to ask our students to complete a web quest, do you know what a web quest is? Okay, so a web quest is an instructional tool, an online instructional tool that is based on, uh, we can say, inquiry-oriented activities. So a web quest is presented in several parts, in several sections. An introduction, which is like the introduction of the activity. The task, which is the most important part of that activity. The, pr the process in which the students have to do several tasks, the evaluation, conclusion, and credit and references. The credit and references are like internet links that the students are going to use to know about the content and to be able to give response to the, to the task, to the major task. So on the task section, there is often a focus question, or we can say like, the main part, the main activity. And there, um, we need to be very clear and very concise, especially if you're going to apply this for online assessment. Remember, you can use online assessment in a blended environment in which you give some um, on-site classes, but you can give some classes also or online. Or you can use it in courses with an online format. Or if you have your on-site classroom, you can use some strategies you know, to, to give some innovation to your classroom. You can use some assessment strategies in your classroom. That's possible. So let's see. If we're going to establish uh, a task, if you look at this, uh, this slide, we have two options of setting up the same task, the same task, but we're going to decide which one is better to avoid copy and paste. If you read with me, we have the first option, the first task, or the first example. Write a 450 to 550 post on your blog about global warming, its definition, causes, and effects, and the policies adopted in some countries to respond to it. That's one of the ways of presenting the, the activity. The second option says, Write a 450 to 550 post on your blog in which you present your policy proposal to the local government to respond to global warming and reduce the contribution of citizens to climate change. Now I have a question for you. Which one do you consider is the best to avoid copy and paste? Number one or number two? Number two, second one. Number two is more personal. Yes, exactly. It's number two. Why? Because as you can see, the task is set 
on a way that the students need to consider their own context, the place where they live and the place where, where, they, where they develop themselves. In the second one, um, to make a proposal, they need to know first what global warming is, the causes, the effects, and the competence that it has on citizens' behavior. They need to know that to make their proposal. And it's based on their opinion. So the key here, when setting up a task to avoid copy and paste, with any task, it could be to ask them to create a blog, a web quest, a video, a podcast, any activity is, and, you can, and we can go to the next slide, we have there some alternative solutions. We need to promote high order thinking skills. And how do we promote high order thinking skills? Using problem based learning. And of course, relating the topic to the learner's real life. That helps them be more independent from the search or hunt of, of information. Of course, they are going to look for information, they are going to read it, but it's not that they have to memorize it and they have to do something with it or th that they copy and paste and complete an assignment. No. It's something that they, it's like, an, like a starting point, something that they need to know to complete the task. So it helps them be more independent from that and the responses, the answers, and, and the projects that they do and that they complete are more authentic and more alike to them. Um, so I recommend WebQuest to establish you know, any task to assess our students. Um, and there you have some suggested links. Can you see them? Can you tell me if you see them? The suggested links? OK, perfectly. So there we have FUNO Classroom 21. Classroom 21 is a page in Spanish, but it has the option to be read in English. And we have Teachnology. Those are free online websites that help you create your web quest. And they guide you through the whole process. Now let's go to the next slide. On the next slide, we have the next statement. It's practical for the teacher to give feedback to students' production of English. Here, I consider it a fact. Why? Because there are many tools that can be used to give a quick and engaging feedback. But of course, we need to consider the, the skill the students are using. If they are using a productive skill, as, an, as the main focus to be assessed. Um, it means that they wrote something or that they gave a speech. It is convenient to use a rubric. And we can use a holistic rubric. The holistic rubric is the one that we use to assess the whole production in which the criteria are all together. Or we can use an analytic rubric and in that case, we can assess each criterion on their own. There are also some pages that help you create rubrics. And they are totally free. And they help you save you know, a lot of time. If you see the slides, we have RubyStar and we have our campus. Students have enough time to write the links at the end of the presentation. I'm going to give you uh, the place where I up uploaded the presentation so you can check them all in a, on your own pace, your own time. Um, but sometimes, as in an on-site classroom, you know that when we use rubrics in an on-site classroom, we try to give them to our students. And we give our comments, our suggestions to them. In that case, for um, a course in an online format, we can use podcasts to give our comments. And there are also the websites in which you can upload your podcast or that you can you know, send it through a mail to your students. We have Voxapop and Podbean. It's very convenient when we use a rubric in a course with an online format to give the rubric you know, with a final result, 
but also to upload a, our comment with our podcast. Do you have any questions so far? Are you following me? Okay, are you following me? We're going to leave the questions till the end of the presentation. Okay, great. Now let's go to the next slide. And this one is about online quizzes. You know, for um, I was telling you before that to assess productive skills, we can use rubrics. And it depends also on the skills we're using. If, if we want to assess the receptive skill combined with a productive skill, it is convenient to use a rubric too. But in that case, the criteria should combine some aspects from the productive skill and from the receptive skill. So we can assess them both. But what if we want to assess only only a uh, receptive skill. You know that in the receptive skill, we don't want them to produce any language. And we can use online quizzes. And this is what the next statement is about. Online quizzes like multiple choice, gap filling, closed test, give the opportunity of cheating. Well, here, I do consider it a fact. And I'm going to tell you why. You know, online quizzes are very useful for formative assessment because they give us a great idea of where our students are, you know, a, a big picture of the learning process stage where our students are. And when quizzes are used in formative assessment, they reduce the tension, the tension our students could have to give a correct response because, you know, they get so tense to give a correct response. and when they are used for formative assessment, it avoids also, you know, copy and paste for formative assessment. If you use it um, for summative assessment, I'm going to give you some ideas of the way of cheating. I can capture the screen with one of the buttons from the keyboard. I can capture the screen and I can send it or share the answers with my partner. I can screencast the test. I can screencast it and I can send it to my partners. Or I can minimize the window and search for information on the internet. Or I can ask for help to someone else. I can do it. But of course, there are some paid tools. And here I try to, to give you some free tools. But there are some paid tools that avoid that that avoid minimizing the window or screen testing or capturing the screen. And there are some free tools that they give you the option to randomize the questions or to set a specific limit of time to do the test, to take the test. But my recommendation is to use it for formative assessment, especially when we have beginners students, when we want to assess reading or speaking or we want to assess vocabulary or grammar. So my recommendation is to use online quizzes for formative assessment. And if they want to search for information, they can do it, but you know it's formative. OK, so now we go to the next slide. On the next slide, we have the next statement. Skills integration in online assessment is impossible. I consider it also a myth. And as you have seen so far, there are many tools that we can use to assess all the skills. And we can combine all of them with projects. A great example of skill integration is to ask our students to design comics. Um, if you can see, there are some comic makers online. They are free, for example, Chundu, Comic Master, Marvel Kids, we can ask them to create a comic. It means to write it. They can use pictures and they can create their own characters. In that part, we can assess writing. 
writing is a productive skill, so we need to combine it with, uh, to assess it with a rubric or with a podcast. We, if we want to assess speaking, we can ask them to perform what they wrote on a podcast. It could be a video, but in a video you have to assess other aspects like um, body language. So it would be better to assess speaking using podcasts. That would be a fully prepared speech, and they could repeat it, repeat it, repeat it, but you are assessing like the pronunciation part and if what they wrote, if they have any grammar mistake or something in the speaking. Once they do that, they can share their podcast and their, their written version of the comic with their partners. So there, you can make a question-based activity to assess listening and to assess reading with the question-based activity. And for reading, we can also ask them to ask them to complete the comics their partners did with uh, you know, another chapter. And for that, they will have to read what their partners did. So the idea here is to, pro to create very authentic tasks and actually uh, use mini projects like the comics. With the comics, we can assess all of them. So is it possible to assess all the skills together in an activity? Yes, it is possible. Well, it's my opinion. Um, now let's go to the next slide. And there we have the second part or the last um, statements I'm presenting. On number five, we have online assessment requires advanced tech skills from teachers and students. Do you consider that's a fact or it's a myth? I would like to know your opinion. You can type it on the chat box. Okay, John says myth, myth, a myth, okay, myth. Myth. So all of you consider it a myth. Uh-huh. What about number six? Online assessment is suitable only for students with a high level of competence in L2. Myth or fact? Ailey says that the students need to have teachers' input on solving bugs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Number six, myth, fact. Myth, myth. John says myth. Angela's myth. Jordana myth. And there's myth. Jerry's myth. James myth. Number seven. Speaking is one of the hardest or the most difficult skill to assess online. Number seven. Fact. Fact. Okay. Okay. Try to keep in mind your answers. So when I showed you my opinion, you can see if you, if you agree with me or not. James Taylor says, but not impossible. It's difficult, but not impossible. What about number eight? Online assessment results are reliable. They are reliable. Number eight, myth or fact? Jordana, and always. <laughs> Jerry says, when were results ever reliable? Well, that's true. John, it depends on who created it. Mm -hmm. And then age fact depends. Angelo says that he agrees with Jerry.
reliable compared to what? Reliable indicates that if we can trust the results, if we repeat them, we're going to get the same result with the same students. What about number nine? Designing an online language test is easier than one for on-site settings. Number nine, is it a myth or a fact for you? John says it's a myth. Jane says, can't see any difference. Uh -huh. Angela, first time design, but then myth. Uh -huh. ICT is sometimes limited. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's go to the next slide. There we have online assessment requires advanced tech skills from both the teacher and the student. Um, I do consider it a fact. Why? Because um, neither the teacher nor the students would be able to use a Web 2.0 tool or any online assessment strategy or any other tool online if they, do not, if they only master how to turn the computer on and off. That's not enough or if they know how to open and close their mail. That's not enough. It's important for them to know or to be aware of the advantages from online resources and materials. That's one of the things. The teacher should be able to help the students because sometimes, even though we have a perfect uh, internet connectivity, we can face some problems. So the teacher should be able to help the students if they face any technical problem. The teacher should also have alternative plans in case of tech issues. So if that person knows um, many sources or many tools that they can use in a specific uh, situation, it's better because they can implement a second plan if the, suddenly if the tool they, if they, are using, they are using is not online anymore. So if it's not online anymore and they know another tool, they can use it. They should be able to give response to problems when there is no internet connection or when the students do not know how to use the tool, especially the teacher. The student, it's better if the student knows or, or if the student masters some tech skills. It's better because it can facilitate the job of the teacher. Now let's go to the next slide. Online assessment is suitable only for students with a high level of competence in L2. I consider it a myth because this can happen also on an on-site classroom. I can use the same strategy with beginners and I can use the same strategy with advanced students. The idea is to adapt it and we need to adapt it to their level of the language, to their age, to the content and to the skill they are using. Uh, so let's suppose um, I want to assess grammar and vocabulary with beginners. You know, it's very useful to use quizzes, formative quizzes, to assess grammar and vocabulary because they do not produce the language that much. But it's important to know the amount of words or phrases they recognize and produce. When we know that, um, we can then establish an assessment strategy for um, speaking and writing. For example, with beginners, if you want to assess reading and writing together, we can use Google Advanced Search because Google Advanced Search, um, it gives you the, the, um, the chance to write the level of your students and then you're going to be able to have many texts or many information online for beginners, for example. Then, after we have the text and we decide what text we're going to be using, 
we can ask our students to create a mind map, a mind map or a word cloud. For mind maps, you can we have there some links. We have uh, mapool.com and Bablos. And for word clouds, we have Wordle. With those tools, our students can summarize the most important words or the most important information from the text. And you can actually adapt the same activity with advanced students. If we want to assess writing only, remember um, productive skills. We have to use a rubric. But where are our, our students going to write? We can ask them to create a journal. They can write daily or weekly. If they are beginners, they can start writing sentences or very short paragraphs, and they can use primary pad. The option with primary pad is that we can access uh, their production. We can see what they are doing, and we, and we can leave their comments and suggestions. Remember, it's important to combine this with rubric. I always suggest rubric, sorry. <laughs> and in the case of um, if we want to assess um, listening, we can ask our students to maybe make a mind map with Mapu or make a word cloud with Wordle to summarize the information or the words they listen from a video. There you have a link, ESL um, video. There you can select some educational videos. Or we can ask them to listen to an audiobook and then to summarize the information on a mind map or word cloud. It's not that complicated because they are not going to be producing so much language. Remember, I'm talking about beginners. If you want to adapt this, you can do it for advanced students. If we want to assess pronunciation, only pronunciation, uh, we can ask our students to read out loud a text from Read Speeder. There you have the link, www.readspeeder.com, in which they can set the time limit in which they want to read the text. And while they are reading, they can be recording their voices on a podcast, and then they can send it to you and read the words. The idea is to read the words Dot com, that's another um, website in which they write the text, they listen to the pronunciation, and we can ask them to create a podcast and read that, to repeat the pronunciation of those words or of the text, if they type a text. So the idea is to combine different tools to make it more interactive and to make it more functional and easier for you and practical for you as a teacher. Um, also, for beginners, we tend to assess the vocabulary they learn. We can set the, an amount of words they, they are supposed to learn weekly. Maybe we can ask them to learn at least three words weekly. And then, to assess that, we can ask them to create an illustrative um, glossary. And for that, they can use photo pitch, or they can use SlideShare.com. I'm going to repeat it. SlideShare.com. They can there paste the picture and the, uh, representing the word and write the word, the word that they learned that week. So let's go to the next slide. And on the next slide, we have speaking is one of the most difficult or the hardest skills just as online. Here, I consider it also a myth. And uh, why? First, we need to know what we want to assess. If we want to assess an impromptu speech or a spontaneous speech, or if we want to assess a fully prepared speech. For an impromptu speech or a spontaneous speech, we can use uh, with our students, remember, for a synchronous connection. They're, we're supposed to be connected at the same time, like here. They can use a Skype, or they can use view.com which is an online classroom similar to this one where we are now. It's free. Uh, we can use it with our students. And maybe we can ask them to perform any conversation or telephone conversation. And it's going to be spontaneous. For a fully prepared speech, we can ask them to create a video and upload it to YouTube. For that, they can use their laptop, the camera of their laptop, 
or their tabs or their cell phones. And they can, it's a fully prepared search because they can repeat it and repeat it and say it over and over again until they do it perfectly. I know that's an advantage for them because they can do it perfectly, but I think that's great and that's the ultimate goal we want to accomplish. The practice, with the practice they can improve. So they can upload a video or we can ask them to create a podcast. They create a podcast with one of the tools I showed you before and they can also upload it and share it with me or with the rest of their partners. Remember, speaking is a productive skill and we need to use a rubric here just, just to, to make the assessment process more practical. Um, the rubric, remember, it could be online. You can use it online and you can share it also with your students. It's important to share the criteria you are assessing or that you are using just as your students. You need to make them aware of what you are assessing because if they do not know, they are going to be surprised when you get them to give a result or to give them a comment and they are not going to know what you are doing. Now, um, here we have online assessment results are reliable. And here I have to say that I couldn't make a decision. As you can see there the picture of the two men holding puzzles, back to me, I think it depends. And, you know, sometimes there is always, there is always a doubt to know who is doing the activities, who is carrying out the activities. We don't know. But that doubt vanishes when we get to know our students well and when there, when there is confidence between the teacher and the students. Um, also, if we use adaptable tasks, it means that they are very contextualized, like the case I gave you at the beginning of the speech with the web quest. If they are very personal, that the answers are only, can be only, I mean, the questions can be only answered by the students, it's not possible um, to know or if another person is answering the question because only the student can answer it. Also, to diminish this um, doubt, we can ask for a computer lab and our students can do the activity with us. So we can see if they are doing it or not. But whatever the case, whatever the case, even in an on-site classroom or a course with an online format, it's necessary to establish a learning contract. And that learning contract should be signed by teachers and students. And they should agree with each other's roles, rights, and duties. And that's important, a learning contract. Now, the last um, statement is about or refers to designing an online language test is easier than one for online settings. I consider it a myth. Even in on-site settings or in an online course, there are some aspects that should be taken into account. For example, the purpose of the test. Why are we assessing our students? What do we expect them to show us? The content that we are assessing, not only about grammar, but also about the communicative aspects. We need to make our classrooms more communicative. Uh, we need to consider also the skills we are assessing, if it's only a, a receptive skill, if we are um, integrating skills, if we are assessing only a productive skill, we need to consider that. Test specifications, I will tell you that uh, later on. And specifying the scoring procedures, as I said before, you need to make clear what you are assessing, the criteria, the top grade or the top result that they can get and how to get there. Now, the test specifications, they depend on the skill that you're going to be assessing online. For example, if you are assessing writing, you need to establish a word limit. You need to make clear the tool that the students are supposed to use, and you need to know if they know how to use it. I recommend to complement this 
with tutorials, video tutorials or slideshow tutorials, but it's important to, to, to leave our students or to give our students a guide for using the tool. The genre of the text they are writing, the context or background, it's related like establishing a hypothetical situation, which is a starting point for them to start writing. The purpose of the text they are writing, if they are writing a letter, uh, what's the purpose of the letter? The recipient, it means who is going to be reading that. Remember, following the hypothetical situation, the recipient, of course, is going to be the teacher or their peers, but we need to establish a, a hypothetical situation and the soft skills from writing that they are going to be using. This one, um, these test specifications are very similar when we want to assess speaking, with the difference that in the case of speaking, we need to establish a time limit instead of word limit, time limit, and the audience that they are going to be talking to. For reading and listening, here we need to be careful when selecting the material they are going to listen or they are going to read, considering, of course, their level of language and the words or phrases that they recognize and produce. That's important. And we need to consider the, the stages for reading and the stages for listening. Pre-reading, in the pre-reading pre part, we need to consider that even though it's uh, an assessment, a test, or a formative assessment, we need to help them with the context. We need to establish a background just so that they can activate their knowledge to know what the, the information they are going to read or they are going to listen is about. Um, to establish some questions that they can answer while reading or if we want them to underline something or to create a map or something else. Um, and of course, in the post-reading part is the product. If you want them to answer some questions, that would be the product. Or once they answer the question, if you want them to create something else, that would be the product. And of course, the soft skills from reading and listening. Now with the last slide, as you can see, uh, I am finishing. To conclude, <clears throat> I would like to clarify that this myth and fact do not make um, online ESL assessment suitable for all teaching situations. It's not suitable for all teaching situations. We need to consider our students' context. If we are teaching <coughs> in, a country, in a country in which um, internet connection is not available 24-7, we need to consider that. Or if they do not have computers, we need to consider that too. So our student context, our students characteristics, if they have tech skills, if they know how to use some tools, we need to consider that. And we have to also take into account um, the teacher's style. So the idea here was to show you some tools and some um, online assessment and strategies that can be useful for our classroom. Even if they are on-site or online, we can use them. So we can innovate our classroom and give a different look to them. So I finish. Um, thank you so much for listening. And if you have any question, I think it's time for you to type it on the box below the slides so I can answer them. <laughs> thank you very much, Marika uh, Carmen. I think it was a very, very pivotal. Uh, presentation with lots of ideas. Maybe even too many to, to take up at one given time. So hopefully John will put it all on, online soon so we can go back to all the sources you mentioned, all the uh, links to the other uh, websites. So I'm just waiting to see if people have questions now before we move on slowly to the end of the seminar today. So if people have questions, please type them now. Mm -hmm. And John has just announced. I think they have to it. type the question on the box. They probably have to. So if you can, if you can please use the box at the bottom, so underneath the slides, there is space to type your questions. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. 
Yeah, they all seem to be very, very quiet suddenly. I think Nair wrote a question.
understand it's all that it's difficult because of the internet connection. But um, it depends on the characteristics. We can we can talk to them. That's part of the learning contract that we need to have with them. Okay, Catherine, then what's the best thing to do in the future? Graduating. 